And you need to step back and you need to look at this from a math basis. You need to look at this as if you were an actuary and you were running a, a risk model or you were running a pension fund. Um, most adults will die from one of three things. They're going to die from cardiovascular disease, cancer, or dementia. You know that if you get your risk factors right, the likelihood of you deferring the onset of cardiovascular disease extends considerably up to uh, greater than 10 years of extension. The line that I use is you have to exercise like your life depends on it because it does. If you can't fit into the genes that you did your leaving cert in, you likely have excess visceral fat. Obesity is going to, in general, lead to excess visceral fat. And excess visceral fat is an engine of inflammation that is a huge contributor to cardiovascular disease, cancers, and dementias. The following conversation is with Dr. Paddy Barrett. Dr. Barrett is a cardiologist and expert in the field of preventive cardiology and everything heart-related. I found the conversation absolutely fascinating and very educational, full of practical hints, tips, and advice on how to improve your heart health and everything heart-related. Don't forget to like and comment and share with somebody who you think could benefit from hearing Paddy's advice. And to all those that have subscribed, thank you so much. I really appreciate each and every one of you. And if you haven't, if you could take two seconds just to hit the subscribe button, I'd really appreciate it. And it really helps the channel grow. Thank you so much. Dr. Paddy Barr, thank you so much for joining me. I'm really excited and looking forward to this conversation. Good to be here. Um, where are you from, Paddy? Where did you grow up? Uh, I'm originally from uh, Galway in the west of Ireland, um, but currently live in Dublin and uh, have kind of wandered around the, the planet uh, from east and west coast United States uh, to Australia and, and beyond. And in terms of your childhood and your development and your adolescence and what you studied, was there anything there that uh, impacted your decision to go into heart health and cardiology and medicine? Um, I'd love to give you a, a really kind of clear, compelling answer to that. But I think most of that will be kind of post hoc confabulation uh, about why I chose to do it. Um, uh, the honest answer, which I find even surprising, is I had a dream one night that I followed a doctor around having a conversation with him, asking them what it would be like to be a doctor, having previously had no aspirations to be a doctor and no one in my family being one. Um, and then I woke up in the morning and I said, yeah, that seems like what I want to do. And uh, I put my head down and uh, that's how I ended up here. Fantastic. So it's kind of inspiration from the gods, if if you like. Um, what are the keys to a healthy life? Um, the way I look at this is it's a math problem. Um, too many people get frustrated with this confusing mess that we see online in terms of should you do X and should you do Y and should I have goat's cheese milk and should I eat vegetables and should I, you know, it's, it's this, you know, mess of tactics um, uh, in terms of how people approach this. And you need to step back and you need to look at this from a math basis. You need to look at this as if you were an actuary and you were running a, a risk model or you were running a pension fund. So you say, listen, okay, as an adult in the developed world, what is it that I am most likely to die from if I get to say 50 years and beyond? Believe 50, the causes of death are things like car crashes, suicide, poisoning, things like that. But really, when we're looking older in life, um, most adults will die from one of three things. They're going to die from cardiovascular disease, cancer, or dementia, assuming that you are a non-smoker. Because if you're listening to this, aspiring to live a longer life, and you are a smoker, there's something that's really not at odds here. So we're kind of excluding that in terms of a cause of death. So now that we have that as our, our model, we ask, who is it that actually doesn't get those diseases? And the model for that are healthy centenarians, people who live to 100 years of age or beyond. And we ask ourselves, okay, now we have a model. What is it that those people actually die from? And what we find is, is that those people die from three things, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and dementia. So the same things as everybody else. The key difference between us and them is that they get those conditions 20 to 25 years later than everybody else. So the model is not actually preventing whether you're going to get cardiovascular disease, cancer, or dementia. Given a long enough time horizon, absolutely everyone will get one of these conditions. 
The model is about trying to understand what are the risk factors that lead to these conditions? Because the healthy centenarians have typically some kind of genetic advantage, but what can we do in terms of modifying the risk factors to delaying the onset of these diseases and then extending our lives, not just in terms of the duration of our lives, but also in terms of our health span. So that the time period of our lives when we actually have our functional and cognitive capacities intact, and the most likely reason you are going to have a decrease in the quality of your life is because you've developed one of these major chronic conditions. So that's the model. It's about trying to understand this as, as a math game and playing the, the game of risk behind that. Um, so what is significant in terms of a person's age? When, when do they move into, is it 40 years of age? Is it 50 years of age? When do you start really focusing on heart and cardiovascular health and really paying attention to it? The answer is now. At whatever age you are, the answer is now. And the reason I say that is that while heart disease tends to appear suddenly in people who are, say, 60 and 70 years of age, that process has been building up for years, decades prior. If you go and look at autopsy studies of, say, soldiers who were coming back from the Korean War, and these are people who would have died in combat, so non-heart-related conditions, approximately 60 to 70 percent of them would have already had on autopsy the early stages of plaque buildup. This finding has been borne out and replicated over and over and over again. Criticisms of those early studies would have been that most of them would have been smokers, for example, but again, when we look at heart transplant recipients in terms of who are acting as the ostensible healthy donors, when you look at their coronary arteries under a microscope, you can see that plaque in its earliest stages is already building up. We know that in children and we know that even in newborns. When we look at their coronary arteries under a microscope, when people who've kind of died of non-cardiac related issues, often the earliest stages of plaque development have begun. So this is a process that begins immediately. And that is why the time to start thinking about your heart health in terms of optimizing your risk factors to, de to delay the onset of the condition is now. Um, you mentioned plaque buildup. Um, how early in a person's life does that start? Are you, are you saying you, it starts literally straight away? Born? So, so I guarantee you that the probability of you having some form of plaque buildup, if we were to look under a microscope when you're listening to this podcast, means that you probably already have the earlier stages of plaque buildup. So it is a progressive condition and you need to think of this like speed. So everyone is accumulating plaque throughout their life in their coronary arteries. Mm -hmm. And we always have to think of three categories. We have to think about risk factors that lead to that deposition of plaque and how fast it's going to accelerate. We have to think about the plaque itself, which is the disease. Mm -hmm. And then we have to think about the problem uh, that actually arises from that plaque. And that is a heart event, like a heart attack or a stroke. And as you know, foolish as it sounds, you cannot die from a condition that you do not have. And you certainly cannot have a heart attack or a stroke in, in the sense of a plaque rupture if you do not have a significant amount of plaque. So therefore, you have to say, well, listen, my objective here then is to avoid a heart attack by minimizing the amount of plaque by minimizing my risk factors that lead to the onset of that plaque. Now, the reality is, is that if you look at most case series of populations over time, there's a rough average about how fast people will accumulate plaque over time. So as you get older, plaque accumulatively uh, increases in time. And we know this across multiple, multiple case series. There are certain individuals who have, say, certain genetic variants that, that make them immune to that in terms of they can have lots of risk factors, but they tend not to develop a significant amount of plaque. But again, mm. those people are kind of a, are rare in general. And mm. then there are others who actually have other risk factors from a genetic perspective that are, are, meaning, are, are kind of giving us this, this situation where they're laying down plaque much earlier than uh, compared to someone who will be an age match peer and they're going to be at much higher risk of a heart event much earlier in life and what most people don't realize is that if you look at the, the single biggest risk factor for heart disease is age the older you get the more likely you are going to have a heart attack but if you look at the number of heart attacks that happen on an annual basis more than 50% of those heart attacks happen at age less than 65 for males and approximately one third for females. Now, the reason that doesn't make intuitive sense is that there's just way more younger people than there are older people. Mm. 
So if you look at, say, Mm -hmm. 1% of people under 65 having a heart attack, numerically, that's just a huge number. So this, again, speaks to this idea that the people who are, say, 60 years of age and having a heart attack, plaque in their arteries didn't become an issue for them at 64. It happened years and years and years prior, and it's only reaching its, its culmination point at that time. And how would you investigate? Is there, is there what kind of diagnostic model do you have for discovering your kind of plaque levels in the system? And what treatment can, can somebody seek now, if you like? So th- there, there, there are models that we use, but um, we always need to be mindful of, of two factors. One is, is how old you are and how mm. likely in general you are to have plaque. So uh, if you take, say, a, an 80 year old male, um, if you were to look at their coronary arteries, the overwhelming majority of them will have some degree of plaque buildup. Mm. The second thing you need to consider is somewhat the inverse of that, is how many life years does that person likely have remaining? So if I went and I looked at a 30-year-old you know, male or female, for that matter, um, and just say they had some risk factors, a little bit of high cholesterol, and they had an early family history of heart disease, and there are certain tests we can do in terms of scans that we can talk about that showed a very small amount of plaque in their coronary arteries. And when we see a plaque in the coronary arteries on a scan, that means it's very advanced plaque. This isn't early stage plaque. This is plaque that has gone through several stages of development, potentially as even kind of ruptured and healed and left this signature mark of calcification in the coronary arteries as a repair mechanism. Now, you can look at the coronary arteries in, say, this 30, 35 year old male. And you can say, well, there's only a very, very small amount of plaque. And that's true. It's a very small amount of plaque, but it is way more plaque than we would anticipate compared to an age match peer. So always we have to be asking ourselves, we have to look at the risk factors that go into the development. Are Mm -hmm. they being optimized? And we know that if you get your risk factors right, the likelihood of you deferring the onset of cardiovascular disease extends considerably up to uh, greater than 10 years of extension. Um, So it's typically going to be looking at things like blood tests, which are standard blood tests and more advanced uh, lipid testing or, or genetic cholesterol testing or, or metabolic marker testing. Then you'll be looking at biometrics, things mm-hmm. like your waist circumference. Um, you're looking at uh, visceral fat content. You're looking at functional capacity in terms of your VO2 max or lactate clearance thresholds. Then you're looking at certainly uh, around imaging tests. The, the, the most commonly uh, used is something like a cardiac CT, which is a CT scan looking directly at the coronary arteries to say yes or no, do you have any evidence of plaque in your coronary arteries? But interpreting those texts always requires context of thinking about where will you be compared to an age match peer? What is, I think you mentioned it there already, but I I just want to find out from yourself, what is a person's LPA levels and how does it impact risk? Okay, so LP little a is the way we pronounce it is what's called LP little a. It is the, 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 the nomenclatures here can get quite confusing, but it's called LP little a or lipoprotein little a. Lipoprotein little a is, is a modification of, of standard cholesterol. So if you think of standard cholesterol particles, so they're like a tennis ball. This tennis ball has a tail um, and that tail is the, the LP little a tail. What we know is, is, is elevations in LP little a, so the number of particles with the tail, are super common and probably the most common genetic cholesterol disorder there is. On average, it affects about one in five people. So I guarantee you, you know someone who has it, um, mm-hmm. or there's a kind of a reasonably good chance that you have an elevated LP little a. It is frequently not tested and is a very common reason for early heart attacks, and it is a genetic cause. So when I hear the story of dad had a heart attack at 50 and his mm-hmm. brother had a heart attack at 50, I'm thinking elevated okay. LP little a. And so often people will present to hospital with a heart attack at a young age. They'll say, listen, it's just genetics. There's nothing we can do about it. But in fact, many of these people have elevated LP little a, and this is somewhat an offer of an explanation and also a therapeutic target in the future. Um, what is happening when people experience palpitations or even perhaps irregular heartbeats? So palpitations are, put simply, the awareness of your heart beating. If you lie mm. down at nighttime and you hear your own heart beating or are aware of your heart, the, 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 the symptom is called a palpitation. Um, palpitations are more often than not benign phenomenon. So people can have some extra heartbeats. Some people are more aware of them. Some people are less aware of them. 
but it is it is an awareness of the beating of your heart. Where palpitations become problematic is when you get a disturbance in the electrical activity of your heart. And the goal that we're always trying to achieve is to match an electrical tracing with the symptom that you have of palpitations. Now, palpitations are, are to do with the, the electrical system in your heart. And when we are often referring to heart disease or what we have been talking about so far is more often about the plumbing in terms of buildup of plaque in the coronary arteries. And they're, they're somewhat kind of different. There, there is a relationship between the two. And, you know, but we always have to be careful about kind of categorizing each condition. We, we tend to use this broad umbrella term of heart disease, but when in fact, heart disease can encompass thousands of different conditions. Um, how significant a risk factor is inactivity, lack of movement, lack of exercise? The line that I use is you have to exercise like your life depends on it because it does. Um, we have no greater risk input and modifier than exercise. Hmm. The evidence here is overwhelmingly clear in terms of extending not only lifespan, not only preventing diseases, but also increasing health span in terms of your functional ability, uh, what you will be able to do as you get older in life. We know that if you take people who are in the top 5% of physical fitness in terms of aerobic measurements, so this is looking at something like VO2 max. Mm -hmm. And when I say top 5%, I don't mean Olympic athletes. I just mean a normal population and take the top 5%. And then mm. compare them to someone who's in the bottom 25% of physical fitness. And to be quite frank, when you actually look at the figures that constitute the bottom 25%, that number is actually growing um, over time. And you compare those two groups and you look at them uh, over the next 10 years. The people in the low physical fitness group are five times more likely to have died. When you put people in the top 25% versus the bottom 25%, the difference is a four-fold difference. There is absolutely nothing else that we have in medicine that constitutes that magnitude of a change of benefit in terms of risk reduction in mortality, risk reduction in chances of dying from anything, risk reductions in heart disease, cancer, dementia, you take it. And the reality is, is that most people are not hitting their exercise targets. All of us are busy. All of us are, are struggling to, to actually get the time to do it. But the line that I use to myself and to all of my patients is that physiology doesn't care about your schedule and whether and if you're not doing it, you're not going to constitute or you're not going to get those those gains that are potentially on the table. And that's why I always say that you have to exercise like your life depends on it, because it does. Most people, um, as they grow older, will also experience a commensurate level of stress their lives they have kids they have mortgages they have marriage maybe they move into middle management etc cetera, etc cetera. what is the biological and chemical processes that are happening when people experience high levels of stress either momentarily over an extended period of time and how does that affect and impact the heart so we always have to be careful about our our, our terminology here mm. uh, stress is the maladaptive response to adversity um, when i hear an alarm a car alarm going in a car park, the alarm in and of itself is not stressful. It is my physical response to that. That is the stress. Mm -hmm. So how we navigate the adversity in our life, the adversity that will always come, the flood will always arrive, is about how we navigate stress. Um, and so then when we look at those responses, we, we know that we're conditioned to deal with generally short-lived kind of acute responses. An alarm goes off, we need to move. That's how we stay alive. The, the, the challenges really arise when you, you result in a situation where you have low-grade chronic stress. And that is this continuous background stress that, that often your, your job or life actually entails. We know that typically higher levels of stress are experienced by those in lower socio socioeconomic brackets and that cumulatively, for all the combination of reasons, can take about 10 years off your life. One of the challenges is when we're looking at stress, is that there are both intrinsic issues related to stress and then there are the, the secondary downstream consequences. Mm -hmm. We know that people who are experiencing regular stress are more likely to have abnormal sleep patterns, they're more likely to have higher cortisol levels, they're more likely to have higher blood pressure and all these things that lead to cumulatively over time increased risk of cardiovascular disease. But one of the bigger issues that I think is that when people are chronically stressed, if you look at their, their, their cognitive well-being, the likelihood of their sleep going starts to deteriorate. If they're not sleeping right, 
they're likely more stressed. If they're more stressed, they're less likely to hit their nutrition targets in terms of what they should be eating. And they're mm. also less likely to hit their exercise targets. And we know that fundamentally, when we're looking at this, this the, 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 the base of the pyramid that holds up all of our health, it's made up of four primary pillars. And that is exercise, nutrition, sleep, and stress. But the problem is, is when you get stress wrong, you get sleep wrong. And when you get mm. sleep wrong, you get exercise wrong. And then you also get nutrition wrong. And then all the things that hold up the, the basis of all of your health fall to pieces. And you are only left with medications and procedures, which sometimes are absolutely necessary. But the reality is, is they shouldn't be seen as a substitute for a, a base foundation of uh, optimizing those four pillars. And stress is key to those. Um. Okay, uh, a, a combined lifetime reduction of systolic blood pressure and LDL cholesterol can reduce a person's risk by up to 78%. I know we've touched on it, because could you just expand on that statement again there for me? Okay, so what this is referring to is, is cumulative lifetime exposure to low levels of, say, low cholesterol, low blood pressure. Mm. And the, the easy way to... To, to think about this is what would happen in the inverse if I treated it and reversed it. So you take someone, say, who's got high cholesterol, say a 40, 50 year old male, and it's moderately high, and I lower their blood pressure by one point or, you know, a couple of points, or I lower their cholesterol by a kind of a small degree. The likelihood of that making a major difference at a young age to their risk of a heart attack over, say, a short time horizon is low. Mm. But the magic of compound interest applies you get exponential gain from that. So that if you make the changes earlier, the gain magnifies. So for somebody whose cholesterol that you lower at a young age, and then you track them out to say 75 years of age. So now we're looking at like 35, 40 year time horizons. Their risk of a heart attack has now gone from 30% down to 3%. And so this is where you see a lot of this confusion about say, uh, certain interventions, and typically they're talking about drug trials, is that th it made very marginal difference. The, the risk reductions were very small. True, the risk reductions are very small over very short time horizons, mm -hmm. but the magnitude of benefit magnifies and, and changes exponentially. And so when people are thinking about cardiovascular risk, they're often looking at data that is pointing to, say, five-year reductions in risk. And five-year reductions don't interest me. I'm interested in 50-year reductions. I'm interested in the remainder of your life. And so this is, again, this is the, the phenomenon of compound interest. Small changes, small benefits made early on in life compound and magnify into big benefits later in life, just the same as you actually have with a pension fund, for example. But mm. the inverse holds true. Small changes in the wrong direction magnify and amplify in an exponential sense into increasing risk. Um. Coronary heart disease is incredibly complex, but prevention is not VO2 max, muscle mass, and strength. When it comes to strength, right, and, and physical strength, we hear about grip strength and stuff like that. What, what is happening there with strength? If you can expand on that a little bit. So when, when you look at this, uh, this literature, the, the relationship between muscle strength and chronic diseases and lifespan is very clear. Mm. Um, often we have to pick a modality that we're going to test. So if you look at grip strength, for example, so there's special testing devices called a dynamometer that you can basically grip and it will measure the amount of uh, force that you can generate. It, it's not that a higher grip strength in isolation. So simply training grip strength makes you more likely to live longer. Mm. It's that if you have higher grip strength, it is a marker of overall strength and body strength. And so this this marker of strength is just the grip strength is the easiest to test. Mm. But it's not just about kind of if you spent your days training your grip strength. It's it's a proxy marker for all the other strength. It's also likely to be a proxy marker for muscle mass. And so we, when you look at people's trajectories of muscle mass and muscle strength over time, it will typically peak out around kind of your mid twenties or so will stay kind of relatively high, but will start to decline kind of slowly over time. And then once you get to 75 years of age, it just falls off a cliff. Mm -hmm. So those initial reductions in muscle strength and muscle mass throughout middle life tend not to be that noticeable. 
But once you actually then kind of hit the later decades of your life, you get this rapid decline. And so what you have to ask yourself is, is that when I get to the, 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 the final decade of my life, the final years of my life, what is it that I want to be able to do? And so if you're so for me, my objective is, is to be able to walk through an airport with a carry on bag, bring it onto the aircraft and then put it on the overhead locker by myself. So that requires aerobic capacity. It requires agility, mobility, flexibility, muscle strength, et cetera, to be able to do that. And that is a very good kind of real world test. Mm. But we know that you have to future discount. So if that's what you want to be able to do at age 85, you have to be able to do so much more at age 50. Mm. So this is where people will, will often go for a test and they'll say, it's no problem. You're doing just fine. You're doing just average. No one should be aiming for average. If you're mm. aiming for average, you're aiming for, an, uh, as a male, a heart attack at 65 and a female, a heart attack at 72. Average is not a good target. And if you're aiming for average, you have to look around and look at all the 85 year olds we know, and we will say, I'm going to aim for average in that group. So if you want to be above average when you hit age 85, from a functional independence point of view, number one, you have to be alive. And number two, you have to be able to be functionally independent and also cognitively independent. If you want to do that, you have to build in huge headroom in advance and be able to future discount that loss. Um, most people torture themselves trying to lower their cholesterol. They don't need to. Can you explain so, on that? This is this is a this is a common frustration that, that I will find in terms of one of the, the the recommendations that that are made, and this is a correct recommendation when someone has high cholesterol, is they should modify their their diet in certain ways to reduce it. And for some individuals, they will have high cholesterol for dietary reasons. Um, you know, they have significant excess weight. Reducing weight will reduce cholesterol. Modifying your diet, reducing, say, saturated fats, for example, will reduce your cholesterol. But there's a huge percentage of patients who have genetically elevated cholesterol. And the, the, the actual the magnitude of change or benefit that you're going to make uh, by changing your nutrition alone is not going to be sufficient to get you to the lower bound target that we would typically aim for. So while I think having a good diet in terms of optimal nutrition is a really key pillar of living longer and preventing heart disease, you have to ask yourself, is it the appropriate tool exclusively for lowering cholesterol? So it will get you some of the way there. But the question is, is for many people who have genetically high cholesterol, it will be inadequate in isolation to get there. So I often have patients who have genetically high cholesterol and are told by various different uh, people that they need to keep working on their diet and keep working on their diet and keep working on their diet. And they come back and they do everything right. And they've really stripped down to the core essentials and their cholesterol has come down a little bit, but not substantially. And they get super frustrated and they feel like they have failed. The reality is, mm. is for some individuals, it will work. For some individuals, it will get them to that lower bound. But for many people who have genetically elevated cholesterol, it will not be adequate in isolation. And they're going to need additional tools, often medications, to get them to the lower bound. Um, what are the comorbidities, conditions that might lead to an elevated risk of heart attack? So I'm thinking if somebody were to be diagnosed with diabetes today, should they be optimally concerned, or really very ultra cognizant of heart disease? Or some other condition. So, if you if you follow individuals over about a twenty five year period, and you look at the people who have diabetes versus don't have diabetes, they're about ten times more likely to have a heart attack. Um, and that difference is not subtle or small. Mm. If you have diabetes, um, you have a very significant risk factor. And when we think about diabetes, and typically here we're referring to type two diabetes, that kind of happens later in life, not the autoimmune condition that happens, say, in kind of in childhood. Mm -hmm. Um, the reality is we have to think of a scale of insulin sensitivity. And what I mean by this is someone who is, who is type two diabetes is on the very far end of the scale of insulin resistance, uh, in terms of they're very insulin resistant. They need typically need significant amounts of insulin to get glucose into their cells, et cetera. And then, but as you move back down the scale in terms of, then you have pre-diabetes, metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, and then insulin sensitivity on the, the far side. 
And so we're all, everyone exists on that continuum from being very insulin sensitive, insulin resistant, metabolic syndrome to diabetes. And so you just have gone to the far end of that scale in terms of insulin resistance. And we know that having insulin, significant insulin resistance in the form of type two diabetes significantly increases your risk of heart disease, cancers, and dementias, the three leading causes of death. So if you're playing a game of odds and you're going into it with that handicap, you are, you are really setting yourself up for, for very serious difficulties. Now, some people will have genetic predispositions to developing type 2 diabetes. That is undoubtedly true, especially as they get older in time. But for the majority of individuals who can maintain their normal weight, maintain muscle mass, and are exercising to a high fitness level, the likelihood of diabetes is exceptionally small. Wow. Okay, that's very interesting. Um... So it's it's something that is within your control, essentially, um, most of the time. Um, you mentioned diet there before. There are lots of fads relating to diet, right? Um, we hear about keto, et cetera, et cetera. Would you be able to point to one diet? Is it a balanced diet? What what is your perspective on diet and nutrition? Um, I think in general, what you what you have to say is is what it, what is my goal with my diet? Are you aiming from uh, your nutrition perspective to stay the same weight, to gain weight, or to lose weight? And when we're talking about lose weight, really what we're talking about is reducing visceral fat, which is the fat in your abdominal cavity that really is the engine of inflammation. So for most people, when they talk about diet, they're really talking about losing weight is what they're, they're talking about. Mm. And that the conversations around kind of gaining weight and, and staying the same weight tends not to kind of come into the equation as much. So really what people are talking about is losing visceral fat. And fundamentally, you have to ask yourself, if you're going to lose visceral, if you're going to lose mass, and that will be a combination of fat and lean tissue, you have to be in a caloric deficit. And you can work out your, your caloric requirements in terms of a simple calorie calculator. You just stick it into Google. And you say, listen, this is the amount of, these are the amount of calories that I can consume. And therefore, I'm going to be in a caloric deficit, and then I will start to lose weight. You then have to ask yourself, based on my body mass, in terms of what I'm trying to do and my degree of exercise uh, frequency, what is my protein requirement? And again, there's a simple calculator uh, that will actually work out your protein requirement. And for most people who are doing everything right, it's about 1.8 to 2 grams of kilogram body weight. That protein requirement will have a caloric cost, which gives you then a delta between what is your total and then what have you spent in terms of protein? And the rest you fill in with fat, carbohydrates, and alcohol. And for the most part, I am fairly agnostic about how people then fill in that gap, as long as they get in uh, in range of their caloric target. So pretty mm. much every single diet book ever written is about how you fill in that gap. But fundamentally, all of them lead to the same terminus. If you're trying to lose weight, you need to be in a caloric deficit. You need to maintain your protein requirement. And then you actually fill in the, the gap. So if you want to do kind of fill in the gap with low carb, sure, go ahead. Just keep an eye on your cholesterol levels. Make sure that it doesn't actually skyrocket, which is a case of about 30% of patients. If you want to do low fat, sure, go ahead. Just make sure you're hitting your calorie target and your protein target. If you want to do vegan, knock yourself out. Just make sure you're hitting your targets. If you want to do vegetarian, knock yourself out. So the reality is, is am I hitting my calorie target? Am I hitting my protein target? Fill in the gap. Is there any... Um, uh, perturbations in terms of your lab work if there is pivot and change so you would have quite an open you'd be quite open there you're not recommending one specific diet over another um you mentioned visceral fat right so i'm in my 40s i would be i do a lot of intermittent fasting i won't eat till three four five o'clock in the afternoon three or four days a week to keep myself slim but I kind of got alarmed slightly there when you mentioned the words visceral fat, because it's not something that I pay attention to at all. Um, how can we address that? How can we measure it? Um, so the, the visceral fat is, so there's two types of fat. When, when people talk about fat there, you know, we need to be careful in terms of the distinction between the two. Hmm. The fat that is on your, your side or on your buttocks, that is what's called subcutaneous fat. Um, that, may not be pleasing to certain people in terms of how they like to appear, but it adds very little in terms of cardiometabolic risk. It is the fat that is in your abdominal cavity 
that sits in your main organs, like your liver, your pancreas, um, and around your major organs, that is the engine of inflammation. So this Mm -hmm. is why waist circumference tends to be a better predictor of risk than weight or body mass index, because it is a better proxy marker of the amount of visceral fat that you have. And mm-hmm. everyone has differing stores in so far as that you're going to be making depositions into your subcutaneous fat stores and your visceral stores. And there are some people who just have huge subcutaneous stores that can put pretty much all of their fat into the subcutaneous stores and very little into the visceral stores. And so they might be significantly overweight by traditional metrics. But in terms of biochemically, they're not that particularly unwell right now. We know that over time that they, they do tend to become kind of more biochemically unwell. But then there's the inverse of this uh, of this scale in terms of, and we typically see this in, in Asian populations where their subcutaneous fat stores are incredibly small. But so when they start to gain fat, a small amount goes into their subcutaneous fat, that store is completely filled, and then everything else goes into the visceral fat, and then they get horrible cardiometabolic consequences. So these are, you know, what people will kind of commonly refer to as kind of thin on the outside, fat on the inside. Mm. What you're really concerned about with weight, I don't care what weight anyone is. I have Mm. zero interest in terms of what their weight is. My consideration is, is the weight that you have deposited in excess in your visceral cavity And is it causing a biometabolic consequence in terms of your ability to dispose of glucose and be metabolically flexible? So the thing is, is that sure, knock yourself out, change your weight around, how you appear, that's fine. But if you're interested in preventing chronic diseases, the focus exclusively has to be the minimization of visceral fat content and its uh, knock-on effects in terms of uh, your cardiometabolic testing. And the, the the main measure, I mean, that that's uh, what one can do at home would be checking their circumference, their waist circumference. Correct. So uh, a simple tape measure uh, around your uh, your waist, um, uh, sorry, and your abdominal cavity. So that's around your your belly button. Mm. Um, uh, I'm going to get this uh, potentially wrong, so people should just Google the exact figures. I think it's 35, uh, greater than 35 inches for males and 40 inches for for females. That's not your your gene size. It's the size that is around your abdominal cavity. Um, so, you know, this is, this is why we're actually kind of measuring up around the, the, the level of the belly button. That, that is a fairly good proxy marker for that. And that will kind of have high sensitivity insofar as if that, if that figure is breached, the likelihood of you having significant visceral fat is high. There are more advanced uh, testing uh, that we can do, uh, looking directly at it with searching imaging tests. The best in class are CT scans and MRIs, but mm. using a DEXA scan is probably the kind of the easiest, uh, most effective way to do it. Um, there are proxy measures that most will uh, estimate in terms of looking at that, that visceral cavity and the amount of fat mass there. And there's certain ratios that you can use. The Some uh, DEXA scanning technologies, there isn't uh, any in Ireland at the moment, uh, use visceral adipose tissue algorithms to actually give an estimation of the amount of visceral fat mass or, or areas. Um, mm. But again, so there's there's increasing levels of, um, of sophistication. But I, I think one of the, the easiest ways to, to, to do this, and, and people get really frustrated uh, when I say this, but it's, it just actually happens to be true, is that if you can't fit into the genes that you did your leaving cert in, you likely have excess visceral fat. And it's just, and, and so the thing is, is maybe you can't, but there's no biomedical concept, you know, biomedical or biochemical consequences from that. Um, and that's great. You're just putting it all in your subcutaneous fat and kind of it's it's not an issue. Um, but the reality is, is this is the, the, the big problem when we talk about the, the issues with obesity. Um, mm. Obesity is going to, in general, lead to excess visceral fat. And excess visceral fat is an engine of inflammation that is a huge contributor to cardiovascular disease, cancers, and dementias, the three leading causes of death. Um, and to clarify there, so we're saying 35 inches, we take the measuring tape around the belly button, the circumference of the body. Anything below 35%, 35 inches, we're relatively happy for men. Anything below 42, we're relatively. So, uh, no, well, so, so 35 uh, for females, 40 for males. Again, okay. I would just double check that exact figure in terms of just sticking it into Google. What that says is, is that if you're above those figures, the mm. probability of you having excess fat is very high. But the reality is, is we know there are people who have relatively normal waist circumferences that actually have significant uh, amounts of visceral fat based on whether they're not able to deposit into the subcutaneous fat stores. And everyone's 
everyone's set point there is is different is different gotcha okay um how do the seasons affect a person's health so just like everything else uh you know our our biochemistry everything goes in seasons um we spend more time indoors outdoors we know that as the uh, winter rolls around and it is cold, our blood pressure will rise. When we're younger, that rise is small. But as we're older, um, that rise in difference can be up to 10 millimeters of mercury, which is a fairly significant difference in terms of your systolic blood pressure. Um, and so throughout the, the year, your blood pressure will rise and fall. We know that during the summer months, um, particularly if there's hot weather, your nighttime blood pressure starts to, to increase. It's typically not as a function of kind of direct exposure to, to temperature, but it's it's poor sleep often uh, that people are kind of, as a consequence of the higher temperatures, they tend to have higher nighttime blood pressures. We know that on average, we walk about a thousand less steps uh, per day uh, during uh, colder months, but also very, very hot months, we tend to uh, walk less and less movement equals kind of higher risk. And so there, there is this, uh, this rhythm to it. And the, the evidence is, is always hard to exactly pin down, but we know that when the clocks change and people lose about an hour of sleep, there's about a 24% increase in the risk of heart attacks. And then when the clocks change back and people gain an hour of sleep, mm -hmm. there's a reduction in the risk of heart attacks, but that gain or reduction is not as significant as the, the increase that, that happened. So net-net, the uh, daylight savings potentially is causing uh, more heart attacks than it's preventing. Um, what really causes heart attacks and their misconceptions? I think we 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 we, just, we touched on some of that stuff before. In terms of a major misconception, is there anything you would you would say about heart attacks? What causes them there? Yeah, and so there's a big difference between a heart disease or, or plaque in the arteries and a heart mm. attack. The, 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 the this is the story that pretty much most of your listeners will have heard. Um, Johnny goes to see his doctor or his cardiologist. He had a stress test. He quote unquote passed it with flying colors and then he had a heart attack a week later. How is that possible? And that is absolutely possible with the test not actually missing anything. The reason is, is the plaque in your coronary arteries, the, the, the assumption that most people make around a heart attack is that if you think of a, a, a tube and it just, the plaque builds up and the artery gets progressively narrower and narrower and narrower until it reaches the point where blood will no longer flow and then the artery becomes completely blocked. You've no blood flow in the artery and then the heart muscle dies downstream of that. That is what most people think a heart attack is. So therefore, if it's a progressive narrowing condition that if you did the stress test the week before, surely it would have detected it in time to do something to actually prevent it. That's mm -hmm. not how it happens. And it's really important that people understand this distinction. If you look at the plaques that cause heart attacks, about 70% of the time, they are not actually large enough to cause any degree of flow obstruction in the artery. So you can have a plaque of say 30% narrowing that's just sitting there but if it's gel filled and unstable plaque or this kind of this lipid rich core, it can rupture. That rupture exposes, exposes the contents of that plaque. Clot begins to form on top of that. And it, so it then suddenly blocks the artery. So therefore you have this 30% plaque, it can rupture, clot forms, now you have a heart attack. But if you got that same individual with a 30% uh, narrowing of plaque and you put them on a, a treadmill to do an exercise stress test uh, mm -hmm. the week before, or even the day before, there would have been no abnormalities detected. So we really have to understand that, that heart attacks are, the reason that they're so abrupt and that they happen so quickly is that it's to do with this acute plaque rupture. Fascinating. Okay. Um, how do you collaborate as a cardiologist with other healthcare professionals, such as surgeons or, or primary care physicians in managing cardiac patients? So what I would say is you, you need to extend the net even kind of wider than that. If you look at the four pillars uh, that, that drive the optimal changes in cardiovascular health, it's going to be nutrition, exercise, sleep, and stress. Mm -hmm. So that means focusing with people who are dietitians, who can mm -hmm. help people uh, modify their dietary strategies or actually introduce other additional measures for weight reduction. Um, mm -hmm. That is exercise, working with uh, people who are able to take people through a structured program of increasing their aerobic fitness, increasing their muscle mass and muscle strength um, so they can get back uh, on track to where they are. Working with people who can help people in terms of improving their sleep, that can be a, a simple, you know, just kind of instruction uh, PDF to actually tidy up the, the core 
issues that people find challenging, which works most of the time, to working with cognitive behavioral therapy professionals for insomnia to, to change that, and also working with psychologists, um, different counseling kind of professionals who are able to help people navigate through kind of stressful periods in terms of reducing their stress. So that is actually where, where a lot of the actual collaboration comes from. After that, we're talking about more advanced diseases, people who have significant narrowings in the coronary arteries may require bypass surgery. That means working with your surgical colleagues. There are certain people who have certain electrical disturbances will require uh, specialty input in terms of cardiologists who work predominantly in the domain of electrical disturbances. And again, it's, it's a very multidisciplinary approach that requires all inputs at all times. Um. What are the most significant challenges or, or trends in the field of cardiology right now? So if you look at the, the statistics in terms of, uh, say, increasing rates of obesity and metabolic dysfunction and diabetes and prediabetes, um, you have to ask yourself, you know, what, what is it that, that people are doing that's actually that's causing this? And the issue is, is that you have to look at the quotation of Charlie Munger, who says, show me the incentive and I'll show you the outcome. We live in a world that incentivizes us to make all the wrong decisions. And people, I think, overly punish themselves because they're, they're maybe they're not hitting their targets from an exercise perspective. They're not hitting their targets from kind of a dietary perspective. They're not hitting their targets in terms of sleep. Or maybe they're kind of constantly kind of stressed out and, you know, and take whatever else goes with it. The reality is, is our modern world has incentivized us to make poor decisions across all of those domains. And they are the domains that are going to have the biggest magnitude of impact on our health. Um, if you take a simple example of when you stop to put fuel in your car, why is it that you actually would consider also buying lunch or that you can't actually approach the counter to pay for it? without being absolutely inundated with colorful advertising to actually push something in your mouth that is really not going to be good for you. Mm. Um, you know, as a child of the 1980s, I remember when filling stations just used to sell fuel. And you have to look at it in terms of, look at the environment if you go to an airport. If you go into uh, any coffee shop, take for example, and ask yourself, is there really anything I could eat here? Generally, that will be considered kind of quote unquote healthy. And the reality is, is there isn't. If we look at the, our food environments, if we look at our environments in terms of how we've set up our sleep patterns, our, our, our distraction patterns in terms of the devices with, that we use, the expectations that we have on ourselves in terms of how we should work and what we should do and how we should devote our time, show me the incentive and I will show you the outcome. We are incentivized to do all of the wrong things. And so therefore, the, the, the challenge here is that if you really want to change this at a population level, to make the biggest difference for the most people, you need to change the environment. But that environmental change uh, happens slowly. It typically requires policy change. That is large investments. But the problem with that is, is it takes time. Mm -hmm. And in the interim, we then have to ask ourselves, well, we can't be reliant on that environment changing around us. We are in an environment that is highly incentivized for us to make a bad decision. So we have to say, how are we going to navigate as individuals in that environment? And where are our pain points? Why are we falling down? And do we have the scope to do what is necessary to optimize those four pillars that I talked about? Mm -hmm. And for some people, that means making small changes. And for some people, that means making major changes. And you have to ask, what are your priorities and how are you going to hit those targets? Um, because most people are sincere about their health, but maybe they're not serious. Because if you were serious, you'd do all the things that were necessary. But the problem is, is the lives that we have constructed for ourselves make it almost impossible to be serious about making those changes. Um, and that's why we have this epidemic of cardiometabolic disease and all of the things that go with it. Plus, if you think about it from the, the, the healthcare uh, financial perspective, the, the healthcare industry bears the cost of the commercial side of the industry, pushing and promoting product to kids, to young people, ultimately down the line, it's 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 healthcare that will, and people that will pay the price for this. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, so as the line goes, you cannot fix healthcare without fixing health. People talk mm -hmm. about they need kind of more hospital beds, they need more doctors, they need. It was like no, 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 no. You're not going to fix the problem over the long term if that's your strategy. 
yes, in terms of an acute change in short term period, we need more resources in terms of beds and doctors and nurses and healthcare professionals. But the only way we get ourselves out of this problem is by fixing health. So the only way you fix healthcare is by fixing health. You decrease the demand, you change the environment, we are incentive based creatures, and you incentivize, you incentivize us to do the things that make us less likely to develop the chronic conditions that are going to be the significant burdens on our healthcare systems going forward. Historically, someone had a heart attack very late in their life, and they maybe were alive for a short period of time afterwards. But people now are developing chronic conditions earlier and earlier in life, and therefore it is becoming a bigger problem in terms of their health span, in terms of quality of life, and the cost that is borne by the actual payer of that insurance, be that a government payer or a private insurance payer. Um. Are you involved, Paddy, yourself in any clinical trials or research at the moment that you'd uh, that you're excited about? So uh, I used to be involved much more in, in research and in clinical trials. Um, it's something that I haven't been involved in as much lately. I've been more in the the space of clinical practice and also education. So you have to pick your battles in terms of uh, you know where you're going to apply your time. Um, I think in terms of future research. Um, again, it always looks uh, super interesting and promising. And we always have to understand that the, the biggest levers are going to be lifestyle changes. But in terms of therapeutics, uh, we're moving into a phase now where, you know, you're looking at gene editing technologies that can actually uh, change whether you actually have high cholesterol from a very early time point in life and then never need to do anything about it again. We talked about elevated LP little a levels and there are kind of initial uh, strategies that are actually looking at gene editing approaches that if you find that individual who has that gene variant who increases their risk, you can use a single gene editing approach early in life and you can just eliminate that risk there and then. Um, we're looking at uh, different ways of say lowering cholesterol that, that are just going to uh, eliminate the need for say taking a, a medication on a daily basis. One of the, the things that I always say to my patients who say, you know, when I'm prescribing a medication, they say, well, I need to be on this for life. And my kind of my tongue in cheek answer is, is you're not on it for life. You're on it until something better comes along. And there are better things coming along. Fantastic. Um, what does the future hold for Dr. Paddy Barr? Who knows? Um, so uh, my, my general kind of takeaway is that I'm man most likely to run away with the circus. Um, uh, and I think for me, uh, I want to be an education uh, portal for for people uh, who are looking for a more kind of sensible approach to optimizing their health. Um, mm -hmm. I think there has been significant audience capture in terms of just simply being a contrarian and saying everyone is out to get you. Um, and that's not true. Um, there's this idea that the medical establishment is, is holding back the solutions to the problems that we have, um, that the doctors are not really looking out for your health and they're kind of made, they're enriched by the fact that people continue to be sick. And it's not true. Um, the healthcare system is just swamped with chronic diseases, and it is simply trying to put out a fire that has been changed and caused by the policy changes around them. Um, you, you have to say, you know, we would blame the fire department if the government were going around and setting on fire all the buildings all the time because of their, mm. their, their policies around, say, road networks for, you know, green spaces or cycling lanes or food environments or around processed foods. Um, the reality is, is people in healthcare are trying to do a good job, but they're absolutely swamped. Um, and I think there is a gap or a vacuum that has been filled by people who are, are looking to provide alternative explanations that are not exactly evidence-based. And I think we need to have people who are going to take the, that kind of a structured scientific approach that understand that there are nuance in everything we do. Um, and provide that information. And hopefully I can provide that that set of tools and skills and templates for people who can get a, a grounded opinion as to, you know, what it involves to actually optimize your health, particularly your cardiovascular health. Um, and that is, you know, why I kind of do what I do. Um, it's why I write. It's why I publish on Twitter and LinkedIn and Substack and do all of those things. Um, because the reach that I can make in terms of educating people um, is is vastly more than often I will achieve ever in terms of directly seeing patients. From a local perspective, from an Irish perspective, if you had a magic wand and you could change something or activate something or do something today, if you were talking to the Minister for Health in the, cardio, in the cardiology space, what would you do? 
I think the number one, our, our food environment uh, is is one of the biggest changes. Um, if you look at the changes in, in heart disease um, and death from heart disease, although it is a leading cause of death, the, the, the death rates have dropped by about 50 to 70 percent mm. um, across most developed nations. The reason for that was because in effect we banned smoking. The, the, the rates are potentially going back up again because of increasing rates of diabetes and prediabetes and metabolic dysfunction. But we've eliminated smoking. That was the, the real big killer in the room. But mm. policy change alone, uh, the ability of, uh, of a government to actually change the infrastructure of a society almost single handedly has made the biggest difference in cancer rates and cardiovascular uh, disease across nations. And so if you can actually take that same model and apply it to our food environments and also our physical environments to give people the opportunity to physically move more and incentivize them to move more, not to tell them that you need to get out and whip them that you need to do exercise. People's natural state is if they, if you're given the opportunity to do those things and they're incentivized in a positive, positive way that they will do them. So what we have to do is we need to change the incentives and we need to change the incentives about how we work, how we spend our time with our family, how we spend kind of time asleep in terms of how we move in the environment and how the food groups that are available to us. This is not about medicines. This is not about procedures. This is about the environments that we spend our time in. Um, and we have we have modest control over that. Processed food in particular, we, we, we don't seem to have much control over that at all. Um, and we, we hear about that so much. What's your perspective on processed food? Less is so, better, obviously, right? Yeah, less is better. But the I think, to, to be perfectly honest, like I, I don't think there's anything um, particularly good about it. Um, mm. I think there are downsides. Um, but one of the biggest downsides is that if you look at the literature on this, given uh, an opportunity to eat unrestricted, uh, either processed food or kind of standard real food that is, you know, uh, uh, you know, we would prepare at home. Mm. People will just on average consume six to 900 calories more in a day. And you basically, so if you surround yourself with that, again, we're incentivized just to eat more. So mm. there's, I, I don't think, you know, there, there are certain bad elements to, to, to processed food, but overwhelmingly the ne negative effect is just an excess caloric load cumulatively over time. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, no, no one has ever sat down when they ate a steak, for example, and just said, you know what, I, I'd love another steak. Um, but you know, you eat a pizza and, uh, you know, it's, you kind of go, oh, yeah, I could have one more slice. Or two. Um, Dr. Barr, where can people find you? Um, so best way to find me is on Twitter. Uh, if you just type in Paddy Barrett on Twitter and I publish a weekly newsletter on Substack. So if you just type in Dr. Paddy Barrett newsletter or Dr. Paddy Barrett, uh, Substack, you can find all my work there. There's a year's worth of articles going back, uh, uh, right back to around this time last year. So as, as, as is generally the, the truth, if you go back and read all the original stuff, that's uh, where often the gold is. Um, but I publish on a weekly basis there. Fantastic. And I'll put some links in the description box as well. Dr. Barr, thank you so much. This has been endlessly fascinating and, and really, really educational for me personally and uh, for everybody that listens to it. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for your time. 